Um, good morning and welcome to my dissertation defense. Uh, for those of you who don't know me specifically on the Zoom, my name is Kinsley Beal and I am a PhD candidate in the Performing Arts Health Program here at the University of North Texas. I wanna thank my committee members for coming, my friends and family and those uh, tuning in online. A little bit of an overview of where we're going today. I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about my background, how I got interested in performing arts health and specifically pastoral musicians health, how I came to create the Occupational Stress and Burnout Among American Pastoral Musicians study, and then what the results and implications are. Um, it's not on the title screen, but on to the point, you'll see a slide number in the bottom right corner. So if you have questions or comments and you want me to refer, take note of that. Um, I do encourage questions, but I do ask that you hold all questions to the end of the presentation. Uh, so come with me as I tell you a little bit about my journey. If you look up on the screen, you will see someone who was neither a church musician nor someone who was burnt out. This was really the height of my playing career. This was in 2009, and I had just had my solo debut with the Jacksonville Symphony Orchestra. And at this moment, I was sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was going to be a professional musician, and there was nothing that was going to get in my way. However, sometimes fate has other ideas. In these pictures, you will see that I am undergoing many scopes and x-rays, and that is because during my undergraduate career, I ended up developing something called stress phylopharyngeal insufficiency, which is a long word to say that my soft palate and mouth did not work as it should under high intraoral pressure. So I needed to undergo some scopes to figure out what was wrong. And you can see in the middle picture how obsessed I was with music by the fact that I had treble clef earrings in that x-ray. Um, unfortunately, I did end up having to go undergo surgery. I came out of that surgery with a British accent, of all things. I ended up having to go through speech therapy to relearn how to talk. And through that, I was able to publish on stress phylopharyngeal insufficiency, which I am now one of 25 case studies in the world on this topic. And that was really a defining moment for me because it took me from wanting to be a professional clarinetist and really changed my trajectory into performing arts health research. I enrolled in this program here at UNT in 2018. And UNT requires graduate students to have a graduate minor. And I chose mine as sacred music. I didn't really know a lot about sacred music, even though I had grown up in a church context, my church used acapella music. So we didn't have organists and pianists and whatnot. And as I was in this room where you are sitting right now, every Friday from one to 4 p.m., I heard the stories of guest lecturers who came in and said, I had to have multiple surgeries on my shoulder from pulling out the organ stops. I had one teacher come in and say, the entirety of the music program quit because of interpersonal problems with the pastor. I heard them speak of anxiety and depression as Holy Week came around or as um, Christmas season came around. And I started thinking, who is looking at the health problems of pastoral? musicians. So I began looking at pastoral musicians health through a broader lens, musicians health, which is really a relatively new field. It's only been around for about 40 years. And what I found was they were severely understudied. In fact, I found less than 10 studies that mentioned church musicians at all, and only one that solely focused on them. In this research, 1998, there's a study from Sweden where their church music students were experiencing more psychosocial demands than any other program in their course. These same students said these psychosocial demands were increasing the musculoskeletal problems in their program. Simultaneously, they had this belief in God and this belief in God and their ability to pray actually alleviated some of these problems. And it's a concept known as religious coping, which we'll get into a little bit later. There were two studies done here at the University of North Texas one said that 16% of all church musicians had noise-induced hearing loss. Another said that 51% of church musicians had pain while playing a keyboard instrument. It was the highest of any group. And finally, a very small cohort study of six people that focused on organists and church settings said that 100% of them had anxiety due to workplace politics. One of them far as to say that, that anxiety led them to have diabetes. And while I can't say if that was true or not, hearing the stories of these people and hearing the stories of my colleagues, it led me to one word, burnout. Burnout was conceptualized in the 1970s by a researcher named Herbert Freudenberger. And he was seeing people who did people work and they were 
complaining of listlessness and anxiety and being tired. And so he labeled it burnout, but it was, it was called pop psychology by other psychologists of the time. About five years later, a woman named Christina Maslot came along and said, no, burnout is a completely separate entity. And it has three factors, emotional exhaustion, cynicism, and personal efficacy. She was able with her research team to develop this multidimensional theory of burnout. And what I like about this theory is it's a grassroots up approach. So if you look at the Christian context, um, maybe on the Catholic side, you have the Pope and the bishops and you go all the way down to the local level and then there's the local priest and then the church musicians are really below them. And the same is true in the Protestant setting. Maybe you'll have a general conference and then regional conferences and go all the way down and, and the church musicians are really towards the bottom. So I wanted to understand what was happening from the bottom up in these organizations. Um, she also, Christina Maslach, was able to develop the Maslach burnout inventory. And the Maslach burnout inventory is not used to diagnose. In fact, there is no diagnosis for burnout in the United States. The DSM-5, which is the standard diagnostic um, manual here in the US, doesn't include it. It doesn't mean it's not important though, because the World Health Organization this year in 2022 added it as an occupational phenomenon and a syndrome. And the difference between a, a disease and a syndrome is a disease they're able to find root cause, but a syndrome is just really a group of symptoms without a known root cause. So I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about the burnout research. As earlier, there is very little research on pastoral musicians or church musicians in general. So I really had to sort of break them apart to better understand the context. So I began looking at clergy burnout. And in the 1970s, a man named Fitcher came along and he was uh, interviewing pastoral musicians health, or sorry, pastor's health. And he said, this is a total myth. It does not exist. But what's really interesting is he was describing listlessness, emotional exhaustion, headaches, gastrointestinal issues, and everything that fits the modern um, understanding of burnout. Later, a woman named Virginia came along about 20 years later, and she also investigated clergy health problems and found that 72% of them had depression. 63% were experiencing low personal efficacy, 12% cynicism, emotional exhaustion. But what's really interesting about the clergy side of things is that they also have this belief in God. And because of this, they feel that they are on call 24 seven and cannot say no. And the Duke clergy initiative uh, done about seven years ago, they found one man who had not had a vacation in 18 years. Simultaneously, they also have this belief in God where they can pray. And they found that this prayer and this connection with God alleviated some of these symptoms. I also looked at musicians. There is a ton of research on musicians burnout and for several reasons. So in the freelance side of things, there's lack of job stability. Maybe you're not getting paid on time, especially with COVID. There are no gigs to go to. Within tertiary education, they said long working hours led to burnout. They also said that lack of administrative support led to burnout. And finally, not enough pay. So what happens when you take clergy burnout and musicians burn out and you put them together. Well, there's no empirical data, but I began reading blogs and I looked at workshops and lots of things started to pop out. These people are multitasking. They have a lack of rest. For some, they had no sense of belonging. They were working for congregations with beliefs that they did not have. Um, many spoke of being trained in the traditional church service. So maybe with organs and hymns and then their pastor would come along and say hey i think we need to add a traditional worship service because we need to increase attendance and therefore tithe and so they feel that they are inept to handle that because they are not trained to do so so whether there was any data or not the writing on the internet for lack of a better term was clear the pastoral musicians themselves were experiencing burnout so I wanted to study this. I wanted to see what the data would actually say. So I created the Occupational Stress and Burnout Among American Pastoral Musicians study, and it received IRB approval in the fall of 2021. The study had four purposes. One was to describe pastoral musicians as a population. Two was to investigate burnout. Three was to look at the relationship between pastoral musicians burnout and depression, anxiety, and stress. 
And then finally, to look at the relationship between burnout and religious coping. And I believe that this study is significant for a few reasons. Uh, one, because it's the first known study to investigate burnout among pastoral musicians as a population. And two, because one of less than 10 known studies to include church musicians in general. Um, from here on out, you'll hear me refer to the study as the Oz Baffum study because occupational stress and burnout among American pastoral musicians is a mouthful. So I wanna go over the sections that we did in the study. First and foremost, there was a demographic section. So that looked at age, gender, education. Did they drink smoke? Did they have previous diagnosis of anxiety and depression? I also use the Maslow Burnout Inventory General Survey, which is the gold standard for burnout. It had good reliability and validity and the studied, as it says, burnout. I use the depression, anxiety, and stress short scale to investigate exactly as it says, depression, anxiety, and stress. This also had good reliability and validity. And finally, the brief R cope also had good reliability and validity. Finally, I created six open-ended qualitative questions to better understand this population. And some of these questions included, what do you think is the most difficult aspect of being a pastoral musician? Another was, did COVID-19 affect your job? And if so, how? Um, respondents were recruited via email and social media, and they had to agree to at least 18 years old and having some sort of leadership role in the church, including being an organist, music director, cantor, et cetera, in a Christian setting. They did not have to be a Christian, but they did have to work in a Christian setting. Data were analyzed via SPSS and Excel. I used descriptive statistics, t-test, and Pearson R correlations. For my qualitative data, I used an iterative analysis approach, which in layman's terms just means what is going on. Based on the literature, I created four hypotheses. The first was that uh, pastoral musicians with longer working hours would have higher rates of burnout than those with uh, shorter working hours. I had two that were the inverse of each other. So first that pastoral musicians burnout scores were positively correlated with negative religious coping and that pastoral musicians burnout scores were negatively correlated with positive religious coping. And finally, that their burnout scores would be positively correlated with depression, anxiety, and stress. So what were the results? Well, I had 1,050 respondents, which was over double what I had actually anticipated, which was phenomenal. The majority were female. It was 60% female, 38.5% male, and the other 1.5% was a combined uh, transgender, other, or chose not to answer. The mean age was 50.1, the youngest was 18, the oldest was 86, and it was majority white, 91.1% of the Osbaffum respondents were white. 85% had a degree with 13.4% having a doctoral degree. 51% did not drink, 91 or 96% did not smoke, 91% got seven to nine hours of sleep, and there were really high levels of diagnosed anxiety and depression, 32% of anxiety and 36% for depression. There were 38 denominations represented. The majority of them were Catholic, about 25%. 23% worked for a congregation with differing beliefs. 31% were full-time paid. 41% were part-time paid. The majority of them were music directors or organists. So 53% were music directors and 15% were organists. And now what I would say is the main star of the show. So was burnout prevalent or was it not? So the Maslach Burnout Inventory, as I mentioned earlier, investigates the three aspects of burnout, emotional exhaustion, cynicism, and personal efficacy. Previous versions used a cutoff score, so it said either you have burnout or you don't. But Christina Maslach and her team said, this is not viable because it has no diagnostic validity. So in their most recent manual, they said, we're going to create five different profiles to investigate the different aspects of burnout. And I've created a diagram for you here to better understand how that works. Um, so as a little key, green means good, red means bad, and the yellow doesn't matter. It did not matter what the mean was for those scores because each of those profiles was only investigating one aspect of burnout. So to be engaged, you needed low emotional exhaustion, low cynicism, and high personal efficacy. To be overextended, high emotional exhaustion only. To be in uh, disengaged, high cynicism only, and effective, 
low personal efficacy only, and burnout required all three. So 83.8% of Osbaflum respondents had at least one factor of burnout. 8.8% had all three. Female pastoral musicians were both more engaged and less burnt out than males, but they were more overextended and they felt more ineffective than their male parts. Those that worked over 40 hours a week were more burnt out than the counterparts that worked less. Baptist musicians were interestingly both the most engaged and the most burnt out. <laughs> figure that one out in the discussion section. The Seventh-day Adventist musicians are the only group with over 15 that had no one in the burnout category. And then for the combined three middle profiles, the Episcopalians took that. Uh, highest levels of combined ineffectiveness, overextension, and disengaged. Uh, when analyzing burnout among congregation size, the results were extraordinarily varied. There was really no pattern. So those who worked in a congregation with 600 to 999, had the highest levels of burnout, followed by 51 to 149, and then followed by 1,000 to 4,999. Remember, I used the depression, anxiety, and stress scale to investigate depression, anxiety, and stress. And as a population, they were all in the normal range for depression, anxiety, and stress. Full-time musicians did have mild, um, mild depression. Um, there were only two transgender participants. So it's not enough to make a call on how this is across the entire pastoral musician population, but they had severe levels of depression and stress and extremely severe levels of anxiety. And so this got me to thinking about sexual orientation and gender and sexual orientation are not the same thing, but it got me thinking, I, you know, I wonder if in this population there's a difference. So I created a new variable based on the sexual orientation questionnaire and there was in fact a significant difference where people in the LGBTQ plus community did have higher levels of depression, anxiety, and stress. I also look at religious coping. If you remember in the literature review, I talked about how a few of the studies said that those who were able to pray and have a relationship with God actually were able to have some sort of relief from their burnout or musculoskeletal or anxiety symptoms. And religious coping has two factors. You can either have positive religious coping or you can have negative religious coping. Positive religious coping statements included, I sought God's love and care, or I looked for a stronger connection with God. Negative subscale items included, I wondered whether God had abandoned me and I felt punished by God for my lack of devotion. Overall, there were higher levels of positive religious coping among the population. Uh, and females had higher uh, levels of positive religious coping than their male counterparts. Um, those that worked less hours also had higher levels of positive religious coping. And to explain this a little bit better, um, I've chosen to use a box and whisker plot. Um, there's many reasons to use a box of whisker plots. And for those of you who aren't really familiar with that, so I'm gonna go over uh, that quickly. One of the main reasons is to look for outliers to see if your data is accurate. Uh, but the way the scale was used, there was no way for there to be inaccurate outliers because it was on a Likert scale. So these outliers that you see on the right hand side, these are called univariate outliers. If you look at the left on positive religious coping, you'll see an even distribution and that everything was really clumped uh, evenly around the mean. Um, but if you look at negative religious coping, it's way, way, way down at the bottom and it has what we call a, a positive skew. And we did want to see low levels of negative religious coping, but I think it's really important to note that this was not everyone. There were some people who had really high levels of negative religious coping. Um, the highest score they could have received was a 28, but the highest that it was occurred in my study was 25. So we didn't have anyone who got all the way up to 28. Quantitative portion. And I want to get into the qualitative portion and let the pastoral musicians themselves speak for who they are and what they have experienced. So I asked six open ended questions. I'm only going to highlight four of them today. And the first question was only available 23% of the respondents. It was to those who worked in a congregation with differing beliefs than. 31% of the population said that, or of the sample said, we encounter no problems working with a congregation different than our own. That means the majority did. And there were 16 themes that emerged that you can see up here on the screen. And 
be most likely to occur with having different spiritual beliefs. So I'm going to read a couple of their statements to you now. One said, I feel ashamed to be teaching children beliefs I no longer believe in. I avoid using the songs that specifically teach false truth in my opinion. There is a deep internal struggle that tried to talk me out of going to church every Sunday. But I know that if I don't go, someone else will be asked to fill in on short notice and I just can't do that to them. I have emotional breakdowns where I can't stop crying after we do a program for the community. I dread Sundays. It's the worst day of the week for me. Another said, I sometimes feel saddened or upset by the things that are being promoted by the Catholic church. There are occasional microaggressions when individuals wish to highlight my differing faith traditions. The second open-ended question was, what do you perceive to be the most challenging aspect of your profession? There were five overarching themes that are highlighted on the screen here on blue and 13 minor themes. The literature reviewed that there are interpersonal problems between clergy and pastoral musicians. So it's no surprise that there were some quotes like this. Dealing with ill-trained and ill-behaved clergy was the most difficult part of my job. Another said, while I am happy at my current job, I worry for my future as a queer church musician. Another said, the time requirement from the job over available time for my family. Finally, the supported environment. Why or why not? There were five themes that emerged. You can see them in the bubbles up above. One pastoral musician said, absolutely. We have a fantastic pastor and very supportive staff at our parish. Another, I do not feel supported in the church work environment because the new minister acts like I am his competition. One said, financially, no, but spiritually, yes. I also need more support through more young adult fellowship gatherings. The church is diminishing in culture. And the final qualitative question I'm going to highlight today is, did COVID-19 affect your job? And if so, how? You can see some of the longer quotes up here on the screen. One said, our choirs have been devastated. I was expected to do much more, but all online. And now that in-person worship has resumed, our attendance and giving have fallen sharply. COVID has placed immense stress on my other and full-time teaching jobs, making it harder to have the energy to do my church work. One said, I had to take on so many more roles. I had a hundred hour weeks. Another said, my predecessor at this, site, at this job died from COVID and it is only because of COVID that I hold this position. I did not have choir back until this past month. I have also masked and distanced somewhat in an effort to stay safe. One said, I lost 7,000 in wages last year with my old job. I'd have made more money if they fired me and I went on unemployment. Some said it affected their job, but in a positive way. One said COVID affected me only to the extent that I had to learn YouTube and I got good at it. And finally, we said some experienced no change. One said, not at all. We are a sane organization that does not fear God's chastening. If you were at the top of the presentation, I mentioned four hypotheses that I had crafted based on the existing literature. Uh, the first one was supported. So I used a t-test to understand uh, the relationship between burnout and um, hours worked as well as a Pearson R correlation. So what was really interesting though, is there was a little bit of a split. So even though the t-test and the Pearson R correlation supported this hypothesis and said, yes, this is supported. And what's really interesting is when I broke the hours down into less than 20 hours a week, 21 to 40, and then over 41 hours a week, those with over 41, they took the cake. They absolutely were experiencing higher burnout rates based on working hours. But interestingly, those in the less than 20 hours per week experienced higher rates of burnout than those in the middle group. Um, the second and third hypotheses were the inverse of each other, and these, um, these hypotheses were partially supported. So they were supported for emotional exhaustion and for cynicism, but not for personal efficacy. And the same is true with the hypothesis for depression, anxiety, and stress. So it was supported for emotional exhaustion and for cynicism. It was not supported for personal efficacy. So I want to talk a little bit about what these results are, what they mean to the future. So the purpose of this um, study was to understand pastoral musicians. 
who they are and how they experience different um, psychological problems such as burnout, depression, anxiety. And this is the first known study to investigate this. 83.8% experienced at least one factor of, bur of burnout and 8.8% experienced all three. Pastoral musicians were more likely to feel ineffective with 41.3% feeling ineffective. Qualitative data indicated that conducting helped lead to this decline in competence, that they felt like they weren't able to have the skill set that allowed them to feel that they had high personal efficacy. 21.3% had high cynicism and difficulty dealing with others. So I want you to think of coworkers or negative feelings towards the organization as a whole. If you remember, many respondents spoke of micromanaging priests, and so it makes sense that they would be, this would be associated with cynicism so that they were overextended and that the mounting tasked, tasks left them exhausted. So remember that the purpose of the Maslow burnout inventory is not for diagnostic purposes, but it's to understand what is actually happening in the workplace and how to create interventions to move that forward. Um, as I just mentioned in two slides ago about the hypotheses, I want to dig into maybe why this could be happening, why the first hypothesis was fully supported, but we see this disconnect in this, um, where the lower level working hours, the less than 20, have more burnout than the middle rates. There was nothing in the quantitative data to explain why this may have occurred, but in the qualitative data, several respondents mentioned having to work multiple jobs. And we know that multiple jobs actually increases your burnout, the multitasking, the long work hours, and so it is that this is why we see this disconnect there. For the second and third hypotheses dealing with religious coping, in the Christian context, God is considered the head of the church. He is this almighty being who has um, created the universe, created you yourself. If you remember the subscales of positive religious coping, they deal with God loves you. God cares for you. You can seek his love and care. So if you believe that the God who created this universe, loves and cares for you, I imagine that has an impact on personal efficacy because you believe that you can do something. The opposite is also true. If you believe that God is punishing you and looking at you and he is going to send you to hellfire forever and he is watching everything that you have done, well, it might create some anxiety and it might lower personal efficacy. And this is possibly why we're seeing this disconnect here. It makes a lot of sense that if you feel that this almighty being is going to punish you, you might have some anxiety about that. And that that might also lower your personal and therefore why the depression, anxiety, and stress scores were not correlated with personal efficacy. I wanna talk about COVID-19 and the qualitative contributions to burnout. 91.7% said that COVID about. To be honest, I was expecting 100% to say it had affected my job. The loss of wages, the worrying about health problems, the decline in volunteer participation. This is emotional exhaustion. Conducting choirs online when they are not prepared to handle the mounting tasks. This is reduced personal efficacy. And the lack of control and micromanaging priests. This is cynicism. So we're seeing these themes emerge throughout the qualitative data. And I broke it down a little bit more into the six domain model of burnout. So these are just different factors that help institutions better understand why their, their employees are experiencing burnout. So for work overload, one said it, it encompasses all parts of your being. You can't just clock out and it requires more than a corporate job because of the spiritual nature. For lack of control, again, dealing with micromanaging priests and pastors, Insufficient reward, leadership not appreciating the quality of my work plus hours and resources it takes to do the job well. Breakdown of community, knowing that I no longer belong in this church, feeling alone in my faith, keeping my faith differences a secret in order to protect my kids from being abandoned by their friends. Absence of fairness. Dealing with clergy and other church staff and volunteers who are in active addiction or treat others badly or in an abusive manner. 
And finally, conflicting values. Finding the space as an out gay man in the church, even though my church is LGBT plus affirming, it is still difficult coming from a Catholic background where I was very hurt by the church. Balancing that emotional pain with my passion and love for Oregon is quite challenging. In the Osbapham study, I asked two different questions pertaining to uh, depression and anxiety. One was, have you ever been diagnosed with depression and anxiety? Anxiety was 32% was 36%. And these are two times higher than that national average. So I was quite shocked when I employed the depression and stress short scale. The sample had normal levels of depression, anxiety, and stress. So I want to understand maybe why that could have happened. First and foremost, one, the first question was, have you ever been diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and stress? And that was their answer there, the high levels. The DSS uh, 21 employees are asked questions based on the last week. And one of the respondents said, I experienced the most anxiety and depression around the Christmas holiday when I am expected to work long hours and perform my best music. The rest of the year, not so much. So this survey was employed between September and November of 2021. So it really missed a high holiday season. And it's possible that some of these church musicians had been diagnosed with having seasonal depression or dealing with PMDD or any other issue not but because they weren't in a high, they didn't come up. There were higher levels of depression among full-time musicians, which makes sense because in the literature, there is a relationship between depression and burnout. Those who were tran transgender or in the LGBTQ community, they also had higher levels. And this goes along with exactly what population norms here in the United States tell us, that those who are part of the LGBTQ community experience higher levels of depression and anxiety because of being ostracized from their community or a number of other reasons. At the top of the presentation, I talked about how the Maslow burnout inventory is not used for diagnostic purposes, but instead used to help find solutions for the workplace. So I wanna talk about a couple of the antithesis for burnout. One is for higher emotional intelligence in the workplace. Um, research shows that when leaders have higher levels of emotional intelligence, that burnout rates, specifically the cynicism in their employees goes down. And there's this age old adage that says, people join organizations, but they leave managers. Another one is attachment styles. So, there's research that says that anxious attachment styles um, have lowered self-esteem self and there's this need for frequent reassurance, which leads to burnout. Uh, avoidant attachment styles have been associated with cynicism and inefficacy and lack of civility among coworkers. Those with secure attachment styles tend to use their community to help them and have lower levels of burnout. Another one was rest. In the presentation, I mentioned that those in the Seventh-day Adventist Church were the only group with over 15 musicians who had no burnout. So a key aspect of this church's denomination is rest. They take a full Sabbath from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. As I dug into the literature, I found that many organizations employ rest as a way of mitigating burnout and that those that take this Sabbath have lower, have, um, lower levels of burnout than those who don't. Another one is managing expectations. So Dr. Maslach and her team recommend job crafting. So giving the individual a say in what their job is and let them um, help create their contract. Um, and contract issues aren't new. Um, I was reading in some of the diaries of Bach and he said, but since I find that this post is by no means so lucrative as it had been described to me, I have failed to obtain many of the fees pertaining to this office. I think we can move past the 1600s. And finally, religious coping. Um, the literature review and this data show that religious coping can impact and lower burnout rates, specifically among emotional exhaustion and cynicism and increase the personal efficacy. As with all research, there are always limitations. And I wanna talk about some of mine. First, it was voluntary. So it may have created unseen biases. So those who were experiencing burnout may have been more likely to take the survey than those who weren't. 
Um, second, I used a convenience method and a snowball method, which was very cost effective, but this data cannot necessarily be considered representative of the population as a whole. And this is confounded by the fact that there is no data that I've been able to find that says what the population as a whole is. So I don't know if the sample is representative of the population. Finally, this data was collected during a worldwide pandemic, and I think it should be interpreted with some cost. To conclude, again, this is the first known research uh, study to investigate burnout for American pastoral musicians. Pastoral musicians in the United States are more likely to feel ineffective, and positive religious coping is positively correlated with high personal efficacy. For the future, I would like to see this study replicated in other contexts. So this one was only in the American Christian context, and I think it should be replicated in other faith traditions or belief systems such as Judaism. I think a longitudinal study is warranted, especially based on the feedback that during the liturgical year and the season, their anxiety and depression ebbs and flows. So to better understand it, I would like to see at least a year-long study conducted. Intervention strategies could be created to help alleviate burnout because 83.8% are experiencing at least one factor. That's a lot. So we need to see what we can do to alleviate it. And finally, I really recommend that this research be conducted at a time non-concurrent with a worldwide pandemic. So I would like to thank everyone for coming to my presentation today. As I conclude, I want to thank the Hymn Society of North America for giving me a grant and partially funding this research. I want to thank each of my committee members, specifically Dr. Survey, for uh, his help these many years. I want to thank my mom and dad for believing in me, for spending two years Googling nasal grunting to figure out what stress field parental insufficiency was that led me on this path. And um, to my husband, who has made this possible in every way by working so hard and allowing me to focus on my dissertation research only. So now I think we have time for a few questions. Um, an institute of sacred music at Yale University that does enter in transdisciplinary research. So this fall, I will be applying for a postdoc there. Um, and I would like to continue this research um, from there. I think while this is important research, it is, it is baseline research that this is some of the first being done. And I think that there's so much more to understand. Uh, for me, understanding the ebb and flow of anxiety and depression and burnout through the liturgical calendar is a really critical aspect that this uh, research was not able to grasp. And it's something I would like to understand better.
in future work, can you imagine or even proceed of creating um, a more apt scale than the NDI for future research? Is that something that we, because as we've mentioned, this has five axis engaged, burnout with three other high points, what happens if a person's also ineffective and engaged or so forth? I mean, could you imagine a different kind of mechanism perhaps in future research? Potentially, my maybe it's very specific to your special conditions, but not for the knowledge that we have. Some of the different survey tools that you can use to determine all the professions and whatnot. So, I use the general one because it's not applicable to this competition, but it's possible that in future research, especially with the religious building, which I was introducing to you, that it's it needs some tweaking and some different words to better understand this population as possible. That's something in time you can hone those questions, hone those phrases so it would be more, more effective. 